Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing universe. The best way to do that is to follow me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at, at Focused Compound. If you want to get access to investment write-ups from Jeff going all the way back to 2005, uh, you could go to FocusedCompound.com and you will see all of that information there for free, all the way back to 2005. We've been, you've been around the block a little bit, Jeff. Mm -hmm. So if people want to uh, read that, go to our website. All the information is in the description below. So we were just talking off air. What are the most amount of emails you've been getting recently, Jeff? All of the emails are the same okay, thing, all. same topic, yeah. We tried to pull our emails together to see what, how can we do shows and stuff, and we said, well, there's one topic here only, which is uh, there's these growth stocks, there's the market, you know, these things, these stocks that I, the good businesses and stuff, they're just so expensive, I can't find anything to buy. How has the world has changed? I'm out of touch with it. it has it become more efficient? Has it become whatever? But it's a lot of that kind of stuff. It's not necessarily a lot of people saying that it's a bubble or I'm scared about that or whatever. It's actually a lot of people being like, um, just everything is more expensive than I can pay. How do I afford to retire? How do I uh, put stocks in my um, account that I need to have that are um, you know, quality enough or whatever, right? Like mm -hmm. there's no value things that they can buy. Prices are high been, is the topic, basically. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I think about often is you look at like uh, like Munger when he would describe Buffett and how Buffett had to adapt over time and he adapted. Mm. I do sometimes think about that. I'm like, is there a, a new evolution here of needing to adapt that is different in the past, right? Um, yes. The reason we brought this up is somebody had wrote in a question to our last podcast where we talked about these forever businesses. and this individual said, do you think that investors have become better at understanding slash valuing the present value of businesses? And this is why valuations continue to get richer for these businesses. Or do you think investors are anchoring to lower rates, which is pushing them to pay more for those companies and stocks in general? Or is it something completely different? It's an interesting discussion, right? Yes. Um, I sometimes think about like quants and computers and information. Yeah. You can basically i mean you could freaking ping the traffic flow that goes into walmart and and be there's certain quants that's try to figure these things out there's so much mm -hmm. information out there you could pay for credit card data um you know rewind back to the early days of the bpl partnership or even the early days of berkshire it was just different you know you didn't have that there weren't so many people competing for these I, returns um, i understand that but if that's true, why did Dollar General plunge by a huge amount? Yeah, sure. And if that's true, why does Tesla down 30%, 40%, whatever it's down this year? When we said at the end of last year, yeah. every indication from articles you can read from open sources tells you that these things will be bad. What happened is, even if people know that, they have to then get out of the stock. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge emotional aspect to it in those things. If you made a lot of money in the stock, if you like the stock long term and stuff, you're not going to get out of it just because you th see signs that things are going to be worse for the business. There were clear signs if you went to any Dollar Generals, the business was severely deteriorating. And there's clear signs with everyone knew what dealer inventories were with electric cars. There were articles written about it for months at the end of last year about what the situation was in terms of demand. Bad compared to supply. And yet the stock responded like it was a surprise. So I have a problem with the efficiency argument for those things because that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I think it's a hard way to test the efficiency. But if that was true, I don't think that we would see the same kinds of things that we still see in consumer stocks where they jump or drop a lot. We would only see it in things where there isn't enough information for the general public to be able to collect, put online and stuff, and for people to be able to use for data. Um, and so I do see that as a as a major factor. But yes, you know, we talk about the numbers.com, other sites that do things for movies. 
yes, modeling of movies has been improved by the ability to um, to measure buzz um, ahead of a film's release. So, for instance, they can correctly tell that Super Mario Brothers will be bigger than people think or Barbie will be bigger than people think a few weeks in advance. They start to know that because they can see what's happening on X, they can see what's happening with social media things, and they can gauge the sort of the valiance, the the positivity and the negativity of what people are saying and the number of mentions of it, and that helps. Whereas before, it was a touchy-feely thing of trying to figure out what's the buzz of this. It was hard. People knew a lot of people were talking about snakes on a plane, but they couldn't tell. Were they joking about it? Was they Or are they seriously going to go to this movie? With Barbie, they could tell, oh, they're going to it. So it's gotten better, yeah. More um, efficient, right? Yeah, those are models where the person then isn't adding their judgment call to it and putting money on the line. I don't know if people were forced to put money on the line if it would be as good as a model. If you force people to bet on it, I have doubts that the emotionality could be kept out of it and the efficiency couldn't be um, improved. Uh, it ha There has been improvements in efficiency in some things, no doubt. But they are mainly seem to be things that have to do with like very low price, statistical anything that you can put in capital iq type stuff so net nets disappearing and, and things like that um, and we've also talked about increased efficiency in spinoffs there's always adaptability though in that the category of stock that there's an inefficiency will change but that doesn't mean that it's more efficient just because people figure out spinoffs were an inefficiency or um, bank conversions or something doesn't mean that there won't be an efficiency in a new category 10 years from now, they're always, what the inefficiency is, is always changing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As for Tesla and Dollar General, I, I think what it is and why you sometimes eventually you get these huge moves with it is these funds, they buy it because it's going up. It's really nothing more than a momentum play that way. So like these huge funds, like these citadels, uh, mm -hmm. one of the big short guys, Porter, Porter Collins, he was on a podcast one time. And I was listening to, I hope I don't butcher it. It was a while ago. But the thing that stood out was he was at his fund during the big short. And then afterwards, he went to Citadel. And I believe he talked about how in his portfolio, if something didn't move for you know six months or a year, and this is a value investor, right? Six months or a mm -hmm. year, the higher ups or whoever his boss would basically be like, you need to sell this position, right? Because it's not mm -hmm. fit, fitting within like this momentum framework. And he had said his biggest takeaway, maybe not biggest, but a takeaway from Citadel was basically like what moves markets in the short term, this idea of like momentum, these pod shops, people owning things because it's going up and everybody owns it. They throw a couple turns of leverage on there. And, um, you know, then you get the situation like Tesla where you said, well, it's not incredibly efficient because we've been talking about pricing for a long time and you could foresee this, but the stock was going up, right? The past couple of years. Uh, and then this year, obviously, it's mm -hmm. down a little bit, but it was much more like this momentum factor. And that comes from quants. And so much of the markets nowadays are those, right? Like the rate of change and 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 continuing to earnings continuing to go up quarter over quarter, year over year. And it just, the stocks continue to go up, you know? So it's something that I think about is, go ahead. You have a response to that? Yeah. The, the one thing that's very worrying about that, and I agree with that, uh, like if you're going to do investing on things, in a more diversified way, you would want to only buy value things, and this is true with big stuff, especially value things that were going up in terms of momentum already. Yeah. Momentum is very troubling because of all the things, it would be the one that would suggest the most that markets are inefficient. Can you explain because to me, most... when you think momentum though, when you say that, what, what does momentum mm -hmm. mean to you? So momentum means that things that are should be priced into the stock are priced in the stock slower than they should be more gradually than they should be. The information is incorporated. And then that may continue to go on beyond when it should and has a lag between the information that should be there and not. We Like an example of this, of what I would say is inefficiency, is we were selling a stock after a quarter. And I would say like, I'd like to own it through the earnings thing because I, I um, would want that news to come out. But I actually want to own it for a few days after the quarter too because I think it will keep going up because I think that the market for that stock is inefficient enough that there's a unusually high likelihood the stock will continue to go up in days after the earnings announcement because the inability of the market to correctly incorporate information that was present in the earnings announcement will take several days at least. And that there's several stocks that we own where this has a tendency to happen. Why does it happen? 
Um, it may happen from a lack of human engagement with it. It may happen from people having a hundred stocks in their portfolio and not getting around to it till then. It may happen because the transcripts don't go up till 24 hours afterwards. It may happen because they only notice it after it gets a big move. And then that's why it's alerting people that they should look at it. And then they look at it the next day and they buy it the next day. It may happen because people are afraid to buy it on the day that it goes up by a huge amount, but there's a tendency sometimes for things to continue to go up or down after an earnings announcement. That's more positive or negative than it should be, which to me is one of the strongest indications of inefficiency. Momentum in general is a worrying one because it's very hard to understand what that is other than markets. If, if momentum works a lot in markets, why would that be other than markets are quite inefficient? And the more momentum works, the more it would you would think that it's inefficient. There are other ones where you could argue, like price to book, I think is a, is a stupid one because I think value isn't price to book. But price to book, just price to book, does make a lot of sense as this could be a, a factor that works and maybe it should work or a size thing and maybe it should work because it incorporates some aspect of risk that's hard to understand. Now, a lot of the things, like I've said, I've looked at net nets over long periods of time and things, what tends to happen is that this idea that there's really some long-term risk present isn't materializing to me. The idea that net nets are somehow turning out to be much more risky on a median result than other stocks is just not happening when you go long-term. Short-term, maybe. I mean, it actually seems more that people just have an aversion to it that it's ugly rather than that it's risky. That seems to make more sense. But academics could argue about that. Momentum troubles me because I don't see how there's very good arguments for it in uh, markets that you consider to be quite efficient. Value and other things, it's easier, uh, quality things, credit things, it's easier to see ways in which a market could be pretty efficient but have problems with a systemically, um, a pervasively effective uh, return over time coming from something that's that uh, basic rule of thumb. But that momentum works as a rule of thumb, I think is pretty worrying if you think markets are efficient because it's hard to explain why that would be mm -hmm. how much of what percentage of stock price movements do you think are just more nothing more than a random walk versus actually moving because to your point earlier it was an inefficient market earnings came out it puts it back on people's radar you you thought they would be the earnings would be really great other people weren't accounting for it i mean how much of stock price movements like i've always kind of thought that 80, and again, I don't know how you quantify this, but just definitely more than half, the vast majority of more than half of the time, prices are sort of moving from a random walk perspective as opposed to because of news or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. The, the, the more worrying thing that we have here um, is that's absolutely true. I agree with you. But that to whether we're looking at, whether academics are looking at, that's noise and it's not very important because it should, like when I take a, talk about Fermi number or something, it should even out. If you try to guess how many piano tuners there are in Chicago, you're going to overguess this, underguess that. It's not a problem. The thing that we're worrying about is the narrative stuff that worries me that people think that there's a reason why stocks are very expensive today. Here's the thing. This is like when you study myths and stuff, the most interesting thing often is why is this myth being told? Not what the myth is, but someone thought it was necessary to tell this myth, right? So Greek myths, right? Persephone goes down into the underworld, has to spend half the time there, whatever, very sad, all this story about the myth. And people tell the myth and they say, oh, it's about the seasons and stuff. This is the least likely explanation of what the myth is really about, right? The myth is really about that in that society, young women were married off and had to leave their family and didn't get to go back and see their family. And that was really tough for them. And so they were told this inspiring story. Much more likely explanation. The myth itself may be fascinating, but the fact that this society felt it very important to tell a myth about a little girl being separated from her family against her will forever, you know, but you'll have some hope to see us again, um, is really interesting because we keep telling these myths about why are stock prices high or low or whatever when these things happen. And I just point that out because... You may it may sound like well, why say that's a myth and stuff? But look, the the main things I think we talked about this on this podcast in general were quantitative easing and expectations for low interest rates, both presently low interest rates and that they would be low in the future, causes a re-rating of stocks. We're now quantitatively tightening and having expectations for fairly high interest rates, and the Schiller P is the same or higher, and people are 
feeling much the same that they did back then. So I worry that we give fancy names to a lot of things, which has no other purpose than that, than to say that, you know, that prices are high because of what reason? Um, Japan, this is very similar. 30 years ago in Japan, people literally said, you can read books, that um, it was a cultural preference for high P ratios. It's a cultural trait. It wouldn't happen in the United States. It did happen in Japan. That argument didn't make a lot of sense because 30 years before the bubble, Japanese stocks were really cheap. 30 years after the bubble, they're as cheap or cheaper than stocks in the rest of the world. So it wasn't true. But it's a nice story to tell. And it makes sense because most of the world doesn't have a good idea of what Japanese culture is like. So if you need a myth to explain it, it's just something weird about Japan. And you'll buy it because what does anyone know about Japan? It's not like the countries that they're in. So, you you know, that's your explanation. So the honest answer is I think it's the third one. I think that, you know, we have to work from having evidence of something that makes sense. I have a real worry with we start from prices are high or stocks are going up or prices are low and stocks are going down or whatever. Now let's find an explanation. I feel that there could always be an explanation that you can find once you know that it's there. Where I have a problem is if you blinded people to this, if we couldn't see what the Schiller PE was, if we had no idea what stock prices were, would we ever come up with prices are what they are? And I just have real doubts. I think you're only telling these stories because you know prices are high. I don't think you would otherwise come up with these explanations. So what do you think it is? His question is, are people better at valuing businesses? Are they anchoring no. to low interest rates or is this I, something different? It's just, it just is. It's, I don't think we need an explanation. Sometimes prices are high. Sometimes prices are low. Why are we worried about that? You know, sometimes people feel good. Sometimes they feel bad. Who knows? I, I mean, it's like the thing with the buzz. Why was Barbie as big as it was? After the fact, we can come up with some explanations. But most of the explanations we have are hard to get. There, there's, there are some features that are predictable and stuff, but I don't think that you can know that something's going to be a cultural phenomenon or not. I don't think you can know that everyone's going to embrace the idea of high stock prices or low, get depressed for a while about it. Andrew Walker wrote on his great blog, yet another value blog. Um, he wrote about like the quality bubble. Are we in a quality bubble? And I did mm-hmm. think it was interesting where he was talking about another trend that I think has the most widespread implications has been the huge run-up in stocks that are GARP growth at a reasonable price. Um, and he said, in fact, many of these stocks have run up so much that I'm no longer sure if they qualify for the at a reasonable price part of GARP, uh, which is interesting. But he was talking about, you know, he talked about Costco, for example, how Munger had said in the past that he probably would not establish a position, but he wouldn't sell it. And he was just going through different stocks that are priced very highly, right? Um, mm-hmm. Chipotle, Wingstop. Have you ever looked at Wingstop, at least recently? Yeah. This stock's a yeah. bit of a enigma to me. I just, I don't, what do we see? Yeah, like, what's going on here? 154 times earning. I mean, yeah. is that, I mean, I we mean, have huge growth. It, I mean, asset growth somewhat, EPS growth, free cash flow growth. But that stock has just been crazy. I've... I, I've looked at Wingstop only. It's, I've never been able to look at it as a stock because it's always been this insane stock. I have looked at the company, same as I said, Dutch Brothers, because I do find the model fascinating. Um, but like I said, I looked at Ollie's, you know, I find the model fascinating. And if it was the right price and stuff, it's never been the right price. It's a hot stock. But if it was a neglected stock, then it might be interesting because I just find the model very interesting. You know, it, it's a very bare bones um, operation. You know, it's super small scale in terms of the investment that's necessary to open up a new one and everything. It's very easy to generate growth that way and um, really low on employees at the location and everything. So it's just very interesting. But yeah, it's a crazy stock price. So we can tell stories about this, but my 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 feeling is like, why are we doing this to ourselves? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. You well, know, because we're a podcast and, and it's fun to talk about things. Yeah, but but I do think that it's important to tell people that look it just is mm. i don't i don't know it just is P- yes people are obsessed with it i, I don't know um pe- you know um why is that's what was my point about why is something a huge hit and then a generation goes back and looks and goes why was that the biggest movie of the year why was uh-huh. that tv show popular and why was this other one that's so great no one cared about i don't it's a fashion thing i don't know the answer to it <laughs> um 
you know, there are possible aspects. I do think it is possible that there are some changes in psychology and stuff caused by social media things that could have an impact on markets longer term. That's the only thing that I do buy about the, will, the the comfort level of people to be in crowds may have increased over time because certainly people are more comfortable with crowding behavior and all sorts of social phenomena than they were before because there's just so much reinforcement of it where they can, outside of their, their experience of it now, because it's so um, connecting with people who they otherwise wouldn't connect with them uh, uh, offline. So they can get so much more of this phenomena with the meme stocks and the whatever things. And so it's an experience that some people can have, and maybe some people do prefer it and seek it out. So it is possible that we may see permanently more crowding behavior in, in markets just because there's more people who have more experience with crowding behavior than ever would have happened before the, the smartphones and stuff. People just couldn't have people like them around them the way they can now seek it out and stay in those situations all the time. That is different. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when I guess your answer to the individual that wrote in is something completely different, you're just saying it just it just is basically like not that it's something's different. It's just why even like try to find an answer to it. I just I, I think like you know there are I mean it's like um, you know to go in a completely different direction than myth stuff. Go to science things where they'll have a survey and say that physicists and stuff some incredible number believe in in multiple universes and stuff that there's an infinite number of them or something to explain things yeah have you seen I mean, interstellar because, yeah because they have no better explanation for it there's no evidence for that it's it, so they have some anomalies they can't explain so they say sure let's let's go with that you know what i mean it, i don't believe that you would come up with that on your own you're only coming up with that because there's problems you can't solve they're seeing things that they don't know how to solve right because of their understanding of the universe. And they're like, uh, okay, let's go with this. Eventually someone will, will come up with something that shakes that up and gives them a new way to think about it. But right now they have a problem where they go, there's some stuff we know and some stuff we know, and it doesn't really work that well together. So sure. Um, there's, it's, there's no evidence for it. There's no evidence for, for this. It's just that we have to come up with an explanation. That's our job. Right. And so when we see these anomalies, we go, okay, let's find an explanation. And we can find it could be that the, the problem with this is like there could be a thousand justifiable explanations for each of these that have nothing to do with each other. There could be one that has to do with all of it. You know, you have all these problems that you keep going with. Um, why do you think Wingstop is trading the way that it is? I think that's because people like to put huge multiples on these QSR businesses as they start to scale because they look at what's the total addressable market. It's a billion, zillion quadrillion stores uh in the united states and or or and then when that gets saturated then it's an international story and they just kind of stick with that i mean i'm sure the unit economics are pretty decent right looking at just the gross margins and operating profit um but yeah i mean it's growth right but i don't know what justifies 155 times earnings assuming that's normalized earnings i don't know if it is because i haven't really looked too deep into this company um but as for the market itself i'm not sure what it is is it uh i mean you could say oh is it fiscal spending there's too much money sloshing around but you know we talk about m2 money or supply money supply is is down as well so you know i I don't i don't really know i don't have the right answer to it i do not it's fascinating to see um you know obviously the one thing we can think of with what we're seeing with wingstop and those sorts of things but this isn't that helpful, is that it, it, you can give a purely technical market explanation for it, which is, okay, there's a mismatch between what people would like to buy and what's available to buy. So IPOs were closed for a while there. People are still wanting a lot of growth stuff. There isn't a lot of growth stuff. And so things that are proven growth have to be bid up to a very high level simply because they're trying to put more money into it than not. I, an example of this that's is... Um, uh, where you have this is we talked about bankruptcy and stuff. It is a factor in junk bond things. When you have funds that invest in junk bonds and and distressed debt, the amount of distressed debt increases and decreases more than the size of the funds over time. And so there's a mismatch. And so sometimes people say like, oh, why are these spreads so tight on this or that? Could be that there's really justifiable reasons for it. But one is 
the pool of money trying to invest in it isn't changing as rapidly as the number of situations. So if almost nothing is distressed, the spreads will tighten. You know what I mean? And then because it's just like there's this demand that's there all the time. And there may be quite a lot of demand for buying growth things and not enough GARP, basically, like he was saying. There may not be enough GARP uh, out there to satisfy them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a mismatch that way. Um, I, I don't have any good explanation for why it would be that way. But someone else asked, you know, what if we're more in 1995 than 1999? Like it's a long time until things change. Yeah. There's no reason we should think that we are close to the end of something. You know? Uh -huh. um, just because something is unusual doesn't mean that it can't continue for quite a while. People realized some things were unusual in the 90s and it went on for several more years. People realized things... You know, before COVID, then COVID happened, then it bounced back. Then we've been through several cycles of different kinds of speculations. So yeah. I don't think that there's any reason you should expect it's a bubble and it'll pop tomorrow or something. I just think that coming up with uh, explanations of why it is. I mean, what do you think are the good explanations now for what it is? And remember, like, let's go to the Schiller P to find what other points it was like this. Because that's part of my problem. What are we going to find that was true like pan the you know pandemic era and now both i mean how similar is the world right before the pandemic during the pandemic and today the world's changed a lot and stock prices have spent a lot of time in the same multiple mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i don't know i don't have the right explanation i mean these I mean, large three months companies and like yeah these these huge companies in mag seven they are pretty dominant businesses the best businesses in the in, in the world right google i mean apple is um. So, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Ten-year treasuries at four point three percent. Um. Yeah, I mean three. Well, I was gonna say three months. I think we went from like almost zero. Um. There was a brief period where it went up and then came back down. But over the period we're talking about, where people felt markets were expensive, we went from close to zero to five to five and a half percent on like short-term money and stuff like what you could get if you said i just want to hold cash no risk against stocks so that seems not to have been it and everyone mm -hmm. said that was it that was the reason right was that you couldn't get anything sitting in treasuries now you can yeah, i don't know the new narrative is going to be well inflation's running hot so you got to own you got to own something real estate stocks you don't mm -hmm. want to lose purchasing power yeah, so I'm not saying it will go away and that people's lives will get easier. It could just be that they're very expensive. When I did the looking at stocks before the 2008 crash and everything, I looked at stocks of saying like, look, they're expensive in 2006 or whatever um, on what is like the Schiller PE, right? And the conclusion I came to basically was stocks are more expensive than they used to be. You're not going to get as good returns. Now that has turned out... I mean, now we're at a point where it almost is not true. It was true for most of that time because the market immediately crashed. But absent that, you have gotten as good returns. Um, but also, stocks were always too cheap. My point was that through until 1995, until you know, 1995 is if we took everything from all the data we have till 1995, stocks were consistently cheap enough that they offer pretty good alternatives, even when they were at some expense, their highest levels for that entire period. Even when we're talking about things, if you exclude like 1929 or something. So even at pretty high prices, you almost could have thrown a dart in any year and gotten a good alternative to other assets. As a result, people may have gotten much smarter since 1995 that stocks have always been too cheap and they need to be more expensive than they were before 1995, right? That part I don't disagree with. Stocks should be more expensive than they were for most of their history versus other asset classes. They were too cheap, but that's not a that's not usually the explanation people are giving. That people just know stocks that you should be investing in stocks more than you used to be. That's the most understandable one for me. Um, so what's your answer typically then? You said that these are a lot of the questions you're getting. Don't know. Recently. Can't know. I mean, I don't. You know, I I don't think that we have evidence to explain why it is the way that it is. Or that we even have explanations that make much sense. Most of the explanations that people say don't actually, to me, make much sense. 
because this these would suggest that each case that we've had in the past was a special case that has a different explanation than the current case. If that's true, then that's not much different than saying, you know, a blockbuster is just a movie a lot of people wanted to see and a flop is a movie a lot of people didn't want to see. Okay. So when people are excited about stocks, they're expensive. When they aren't, they, they're cheap. And the reasons why they're excited or pessimistic about them are totally different each time. Um, and I don't think we have a much better answer than that. Because the problem that I think people haven't dealt with is, look, everyone said the reason was quantitative easing and low interest rates. That changed. And it's not just that people people are now dealing with this thing and ignoring the fact that, oh, wait a second, we were completely wrong about before then. Mm -hmm. Because the you know economic things are done, other things equal. Other things are pretty equal, yeah, except sure. for interest rates. And yet that obviously didn't move it. You know, um, but it also didn't move the housing market the way that you might think. And, you know, uh, maybe people's expectations about that those things are wrong and that that wasn't the reason why stocks were doing as well in the 2010s as they did. I mean, do you, do you think that there's an explanation this time? What is your feeling just based on how people talk, how they invest? If you didn't know about have to come up with a grand theory of other times, but just dealing with this time, why do you think stocks are priced the way they are right now? I think people are now more than ever. I think people are more um, confused because the narrative for so long was low interest rates. Where else are you going to get your money? Where else are you going to get your yield? Uh, just extreme stimulus. And that's obviously been completely reversed and stocks continue to go higher. Um, you know, you could even make the argument about deficits and spending. So I think most of, to your point, most of what the narrative was to justify it continuing to go up every single day has sort of been flipped, but the result has still been the same, you know, at least so far. Now, one possibility that gold is, is breaking true. out, which is pretty interesting. So I don't know what that mm -hmm. means. I've been following that recently because I follow Amark Precious Metals and I like to just follow mm -hmm. different sorts of commodities and whatnot. And silver and both gold have been going higher as well mm -hmm. uh, in a pretty big way. So one thing that's kind of understandable is people could have learned to invest more in the, like you said, the leading growth companies. Because the biggest companies in the, and I'm not even sure we should call them growth companies, but you know, the MAG7, let's call them. The, the biggest companies in the S&P have outperformed everyone below them They've grown faster than you would ever expect for things that size, and they've gotten to be a bigger and bigger part of the index. So people could keep saying, "Oh, well, um, they're they're too they they won't do well. They're too big and everything." And yet, they actually just even business performance has been good. It is just a stock growing going up, but that they've been very growthy for being the biggest companies there are. So you could have learned through the 2010s to bet on the biggest companies, and that could reinforce that today. The problem I see with that is that's what I saw in the 1990s. It's not what I see today. Uh, I actually don't see that the MAG7 type stocks are ridiculously expensive versus other stocks. What I see is anything that has much growth or quality to it at all is bid up. And we said that before. And that's why I tried to stress even things like Transcat, small company, not a company people should be paying a lot of attention to, expensive. You know, FICO went from being a like billion dollar company to a $30 billion company or something. Um, th there's, I don't have a lot of examples of small cap quality, e even micro cap quality. That's unusually cheap. Whereas in the nineties, what was interesting is multiples on small companies in many cases contracted at the same time, the stock, the Schiller P was going up. So you actually got better and better GARP stuff in the very small companies at the same time that the overall market was getting really expensive. And this I see as being much more pervasive across all parts of the market um, that they're quite expensive. There, I don't see a lot of companies outside of the things we talk about all the time, oil, airlines, banking, supermarkets. You know, you take those kinds of things out. There's a few others, commodity-related things um, that have lower than normal PE multiples. Right. So just a, lots of stocks are at multiples that are on the higher end 
of what they normally have at middle or higher end or something. So I don't see a bifurcated market the way that I would say then characterize the 90s. Although I guess you could say, look, if it's, what do we look at? What, you know, NVIDIA and stuff. I guess it is if something's, I'm saying it's expensive at 30 times, but if it's the big ones are at 60 and 90, then maybe 30 is the bargain. Yeah. Expectations are very high for if you have you seen analyst sure. expectations for earnings next yeah. year and the year after that they're yeah. extraordinarily high for the S and P yeah mm-hmm. so but usually those don't matter because either they're high or they're low but after the first few years they are back to being on a long term trajectory that's never been far from what it you would have ever expected it to be so if you're short term oriented yeah that's nice that you get that but then after that you know it considerably slows down. Right. So like if you're worried there's a recession, that's that's bad. But the good news is, is when you come out of recession, you have amazing earnings growth. If you think you're in a boom, the bad news is that, you know, earnings growth is quite poor after the boom, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. um, for individual stocks, it can vary. Like we have no idea what NVIDIA will do long term in terms of earnings, but we should have an idea of what the S&P and the Dow will do as groups. That should yeah. be hard to draw a line that they should stick pretty close to. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. If this is the first time you're joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we have out on the internet. And if you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at Andrew at FocusedCompounding.com. I want to thank everybody so much for all the support, and we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.